The following piece is part of Uncollected, a collection of peculiar prose and poetry, a project by Olomopolo Media with the support of the Embassy of France in Pakistan and the Alliance Francaise. Lost Letters Written by Hassan Tahir Latif Read by the author The following letters are printed as discovered in a worn-out copy of a book entitled Mediterranean Postcards by S, found at the Anarkali Book Bazaar. The names have been redacted to maintain privacy. Letter 1, dated 3rd July 1925, London. Found with a black and white photograph featuring two gentlemen, both in formal black tie attire, one fair, one darker. Darling Jay, I hope this reaches you in the best of your health and that the trip home was not too arduous. As I write this, you are probably sailing across the Mediterranean, enjoying the sun, while I face the temperamental English summer. I am peeved that I was not able to wish you a proper farewell before you set sail. A informed me that your parents had planned a surprise trip home through the continent and were anxious to be on their way as soon as possible. What a funny thing life is. One moment you are celebrating with your beloved and the next he is gone, as if these years never happened. Seeing your room, empty, stripped of every memory we had made there, it was all too much to bear. I will admit, a tear may have escaped from this Englishman's eyes. Gallivanting across Europe was supposed to be our special adventure. It appears we need to find a new one. We are officially gentlemen of the world, as my mother has put it, no more bound to those hallowed halls, but intrepid travellers on this journey called life. I await all that it will bring for us. At this moment, I am at my aunt's flat in London, she has generously allowed me to use her rooms as my temporary quarters while I seek gainful employment in the city. It is looking tough, but your ducky is full of hope. Though, for now it seems bleak without you by my side. Jay, I am eager to hear all about your travels. I expect a detailed account and nothing short of it. The thought of you warming yourself on a sunny beach by the Mediterranean is keeping me warm during these increasingly cold English nights. My dearest, I leave you with my best wishes and this photograph from our end-of-year dinner. Father managed to convince the developer to rush the process so it could accompany this letter. How handsome you look with that perfect hair. I shall miss messing it up and watching you run to fix yourself. I await your return to our shores and to me. Lovingly yours, S. P.S. The photograph reminds me that your silver necktie is still with me. A kiss for a tie? Letter 2, 17th September, 1925, London. Dearest Jay, writing to inform you that my search for employment has not borne any fruit. I shall be moving back to Rye. My father has spoken to the local newspaper editor there, and he is all too eager to have me work with him. A fair amount of unpaid labor is what I expect will transpire. I dread going back to the village, but for now I have no alternative. I imagine you are either still abroad on your adventures, or perhaps you're already home. How are the horses? Have you convinced your parents to let you come back to England? These arms long to hold you again. Anxiously awaiting word from you, mon cher. Write soon. Ever yours in love. S. Letter 3. 3rd December 1925. Rye. Found with faded news clippings of articles written by the author of the letter, from a Rye-based newspaper. My most beloved Jay, I worry that my previous letters did not reach you. I'm sending these to your Lahore address. However, I wonder if you are perhaps in the countryside and have as yet not been able to read these. Or, and I shudder to think this, your letters have not been reaching me. It is quite unlike you to not respond, and you promise not to lose touch, no matter what. I shall hold myself to that self-same promise and continue to write. I imagine some disgruntled postal clerk receiving our misplaced letters and reading them with his evening tea, chuckling at our misfortune. Moving back home has been quite an adjustment, as you can imagine. I have been a busy worker bee working for the local newspaper. The editor, Mr. M, is a kindly old man. The work, though, barely holds any challenge. In my spare time, of which there is more than I would like, I have taken to assisting at my old school. The schoolmaster is grateful for my support, but I can see the disappointment in his eyes. I was supposed to be a star pupil, destined for greater feats than marking dictation assignments. 
The disappointment is not his alone. Although they do not say it out loud, I am certain my parents share in his dismay. They probably assumed that my sojourn at home was for a limited time and that I would be back in London, or some other big city, doing important work. Their only son, however, is still living with them in their old age. I have been sending inquiries for work all over and I am hoping one will take me away from here soon. Rye is lonely, Jay, and I miss you. I went up to London a few times, but our old haunts are not the same without you. I dare not go back to Cambridge, or else I will crumble entirely. The nights are lonelier than the days without the comfort of your arms. Remember that one night F almost walked in on us and I had to escape through the window and hide till he left? I was so afraid a night watchman would find me. Oh, how we laughed. I wish you were here so I could let you take all my worries away in the sweet, gentle way you always did. Are you not going to return as you promised? In your absence, I have started going on walks, as far as my legs can take me. I see you in every face I pass and being away from people helps a little. Even then, I am invariably led to you, through a flower you liked, a bird you marveled at. There are times I see you in cloud formations. A while ago, I spotted a rower and I could have sworn it was you. Do you remember that time I waited behind the bushes for your rowing compatriots to leave so I could have you to myself, looking like a lost duck, as you put it? And you were all sweaty, wet, glistening in the sun. And then you pulled me into those strong arms and we made love in the reeds, oblivious to the world. Was it a dream? I must stop now, else this pain will be unbearable. Please, write back soon. Or better yet, come back and cure me of this longing. Always your little ducky, S. Hastily scribbled, P.S. I just received a letter asking me to come up to London. A newspaper would like to make me an offer. I start in the new year and they would like me to report in foreign cultural affairs. Perhaps a position as a foreign correspondent is in my future. Has my luck turned? Maybe I'll finally get to travel the world and write about my adventures. Thanks, Zeus. Letter 4, 12th May 1926, London. Dear J. It has taken every ounce of will in my body to bring myself to write and send this to you. Many drafts lie stuffed in a drawer along with several unsent letters from the last few months. Upon not hearing from you, I was consumed with dark thoughts that kept me awake at nights. I even, stupidly, put in an inquiry with a Lahore-based journalist asking after you. I deduced that you had no plans of returning once I learned that you have taken up politics in your country. Still, I expected to receive word from you. Every doorbell, every knock on my door, every new letter that arrived gave me brief hope that it was you. My mind made excuses for your behavior. You always took your time to carefully construct a response to any letter. So perhaps that is all I needed. Time. Months went by and I began losing what little hope I had of you ever returning to my life. You began resembling a ghost and I questioned my own sanity. I wondered if I had wronged you in any way. How else could I explain your vanishing act after three blissful years we shared? My naive fantasies of us leaving this world behind and moving somewhere to start over together were swiftly shattered after the events of March this year. I had not seen our good friend A for quite some time, so when it chanced upon him in London, we had a few pints together. Naturally, you came up in the conversation and imagined my shock upon hearing that you were not only alive and well, but married. It was a punch to my gut when I heard that you were also in London, with your new bride, before sailing to France to honeymoon. I completely understand now how it feels to have the earth beneath you give way. My disbelief must have been apparent on my face, because I saw the pity in A's eyes. Learning of your hotel, I resolved to confront you. I stood for hours at the corner of your street, waiting to accost you. People mistook me for a beggar a few dozen times, but was I not indeed a beggar after your love? Eventually, you came out and I felt a terrible pang of longing to run up to you and hold you, kiss you and even forgive you for everything. Then I saw her, your bride, and my resolve ebbed away. She is quite pretty, and I wonder if in another life we could have been friends. The note in my pocket asking to see you was burning a hole and somehow I mustered enough strength to ask a passerby to hand it to you. Seeing you glanced at it cursorily, crumple it and throw it away was a dagger to my heart. It was not the note, but my heart that you tossed away so casually. In this cruel world that is set so resolutely against a love like ours, I had deluded myself into thinking that somehow ours would be the one to survive. 
Oh, what a cruel trick of fate that she would dismiss this love not through a Wildean debacle, but via the hands of the one who put them on my heart and promised me a forever. I do not know how I made it back to my flat that night. You have played me for a fool. How cruelly you dismissed everything that we had shared. What sort of monster have you become? Did I mean nothing to you, Jay? Was I simply a plaything? Had you always planned to discard me? You did not even deign to give me a proper goodbye? Mostly, though, I am ashamed at myself for being so foolish and holding on to a dream that is clearly a nightmare for you. I contemplated flinging myself into the Thames, to be the filth that you have made me feel like. But what would that even mean to one as cold as you? I thank you, though, for ridding me of my infantile vision for my life. With this, I free myself of you. S. An unsent note. 10th March, 1926, London. Wait for me. I shall come at midnight. J. For other stories and poems from this collection, follow Olomopolo on Instagram, Facebook, SoundCloud and YouTube.